James Whitcomb Riley, known as the Hoosier Poet, born in Greenfield, Indiana in 1849. He was a sign painter, a Bible salesman, a patent medicine hawker, and ultimately became the Poet Laureate of America at the turn of the century. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a letter of recommendation for him to get a job so he could make a living. He faked a poem by Edgar Allan Poe, which, when it was discovered to be a fake, cost him his job. Colorful and clever as a dialectic specialist, he was the consummate wordsmith. He died at the age of 66 in 1916. I hope you enjoy his musings as much as I have enjoyed reading them. I've been a kind of musin', as the feller says, and I'm about of the conclusion that there ain't no better time when you come to cipher on it than the times we used to know when we swore our first doggone it, sort of solemn-like and low. You get my idea, do you? Little tad, you understand, just a wishin' through and through you that you only was a man. And yet here I am this minute, even sixty to a day, and forgetting all that's in it, wishing just the other way. I ain't no hand to lecture on the times or demonstrate where the trouble is or hector and domineer with fate, but when I get so flurried and so pestered-like and blue and so real audacious worried, let me tell you what I do. I just jee-haw the hosses and unhook the swingle tree where the hazel bushes tosses down their shatters over me, and I draw my plug of navy and I climb the fence and set just a thinking here, high gravy, till my eyes is ringing wet. Though I still can see the trouble of the present, I can see, kind of like my sight would double, all the things that used to be. And the flutter of the robin and the teeter of the wren sets the willow branches bobbing, how do you do them now to then? The deadening in the thicket's just a bilin' full of June, from the rattle of the cricket to the yallerhammer's tune, and the catbird in the bottom and the sap suck on the snag. Seems if they can't, I'd rot them just do nothing else but brag. Their music and the twitter of the bluebird and jay and the sassy little critter just a peckin' all the day. There's music in the flicker, and there's music in the thrush, and there's music in the snicker of the chipmunk in the brush. There's music all around me, and I go back in a dream sweeter yet than ever found me fast asleep. And in the stream that used to split the meadow where the dandelions growed, I stand knee-deep and redder than the sunset down the road. That's when I've been a-fishin', and there's other fellas too, with their hickory poles a-swishing out behind them, and a few little shiners on our strings with their tails a tiptoe and bloom, and we dance them in our fingers all a happy journey home. I can see us, true to nature, from the time we started out with a biscuit and a tater in our little roundabout. I can see our lines a-tangling and our elbows in a jam, and our naked legs a-dangling from the apron of the dam. I can see the honeysuckle climbing up around the mill. I can hear the water chuckle and the wheel growing still. And from the bank below it, I can steal the old canoe and just get in and row it like the miller used to do. Why, I get my fancy focused on the past so mortal plain, I can even smell the locust blossoms blooming in the lane. And I hear the cowbells clinking sweeter tunes and monkey musk for the lightning bugs a-blinking and a-dancing in the dusk. And when I've kept on musin', as the feller says, till I'm firm fixed in the conclusion that there ain't no better time when you come to cipher on it than the old times, I declare I can wake up and say, doggone it, just as soft as any prayer. If you never heard of Hunchley, I would say in his behalf, he's a jovial bachelor as ever raised a laugh, and as fond of boon companions, yet with all as tried and true a gentleman of honor as the writer ever knew. And if he has a weakness, as a weakness it depends on a certain strength of kindness he bestows upon his friends, 
being simple, undesigning, and of courteous address, all hearts are open to him and his friends are numberless. And this is how it happened some discrepancies befell at the late Thanksgiving dinner which began at his hotel, where it seems the guests invited were selected more to be in keeping with his bounty than the laws of harmony. For there among the number were two rivals of the press who had paragraphed each other with prolonged maliciousness. And in their respective columns had a thousand times declared that the other fellow daresent when the other fellow dared. And cheek by jowl together were two members of the bar politically, legally, and socially at war who denounced each other daily and in every local phrase that could make the matter binding all the balance of their days. Of the medical fraternity, fraternity is good, there were four or five disciples of the healing brotherhood, botanic and eclectic, and some others that persist in orthographic wranglings such as homeopathist. And an ordinary actor and an actor of renown, whose cue, it seemed, for smiling was the other actor's frown. And the most loquacious author my remembrance can recall, and a little bench leg poet that couldn't talk at all. In fact, the guests assembled as they gathered round the feast wore expressions such as savored not of thankfulness the least. And to a close observer was suggestive of the dread and shadowy disaster that was hanging overhead. Now, the simple Mr. Hunchley had invited, with the rest, a melancholy pastor, and in honor of the guest and the notable occasion, he desired a special grace, which the thankful pastor offered with a very thankless face. And at this unhappy juncture came a journalistic pun, which the rival designated as a most atrocious one, at which the grim projector with a covert look of hate shook a little dust of fine cut and the other fellow's plate. And the viands circulated with a sudden gust of wit from a lawyer instituted for the other's benefit. Then the victim spun a story with exasperating mirth that reflected his opponent as of small judicial worth. Then a medical discussion on the stomach swelled the gale and the literary appetite began to droop and fail while a sportive reminiscence from an absent-minded host blanched the features of the pastor to the pallor of a ghost. And a deep, sonorous murmur slowly grew and grew and grew, till the similes that suited it were singularly few. For even now at leisure and with nothing else to do, a task of lesser promise I can say I never knew. I have heard the tread of armies as they marched upon the foe, and among the Alps have listened to the avalanche of snow. I have leaned upon Niagara and heard the wailing tide where it leaps its awful chasm in unending suicide. I have heard the trampling footsteps of the roaring hurricane as he lashed his tail of lightning and tossed his shaggy mane. I have heard the cannonading of the devastating storm and the falling politician howling loudly for reform. But on mystic voice of terror ever bred of nature's law could awake the sense of wonder and dismay and doubt and awe that thrilled my inmost being as the conversation swelled to a mad chaotic focus in which everybody yelled. There's a vision in my fancy, misty-like and undefined, of an actor with his collar loose and sticking up behind, and another, though I hesitate to chronicle the fact, writhing underneath the table in a wild contortion act. There's a shadowy remembrance of a group of three or four who were seemingly dissecting another on the floor, and the form of Mr. Hunchley dancing round a couple more, and a phantom with a chicken leg breaking for the door. And here my memory wavers. I recall the heated breath of a gentleman who held me with the very grip of death. And as my reeling pencil scrawls the scene of my release, I'm as full of glad thanksgiving as my soul is full of peace. But this is how it happened. These discrepancies befell at the late Thanksgiving dinner Hunchley gave at his hotel, where it seems the guests invited were selected more to be in keeping with his bounty than the laws of harmony. 
we must get home. How could we stray like this? So far from home, we know not where it is. Only in some fair apple blossomy place of children's faces and the mother's face, we dimly dream it till the vision clears, even in the eyes of fancy, glad with tears. We must get home, for we've been away so long it seems forever and a day, and oh, so very homesick we have grown. The laughter of the world is like a moan in our tired hearing, and its song as vain. We must get home. We must get home again. We must get home with heart and soul. We yearn to find the long lost pathway and return. The child's shout lifted from the questing band of old folk, faring weary hand in hand, but faces brightening as if clouds at last were showering sunshine on us as they passed. We must get home, it hurts so, staying here, where fond hearts must be wept out tear by tear, and where to where wet lashes means at best, when most our lack, the least our hope of rest. We must get home. We must get home again. We must get home, home to the simple things, the morning glories twirling up the strings in bugling color as they blazed in blue and white or garden gates we scampered through, the long grape arbor with this undershade blue as the green and purple overlaid, we must get home. All is so quiet there. The touch of loving hands on brow and hair, dim rooms wherein the sunshine is made mild. The lost love of the mother and the child restored in restful lullabies of rain. We must get home. We must get home again. The rows of sweet corn and the china beans beyond the lettuce beds where towering leans the giant sunflower in barbaric pride guarding the barn door and the lane outside the honeysuckles midst the hollyhocks that clamber almost to the martin box. We must get home where, as we nod and drowse, time humors us and tiptoes through the house and loves us best when sleeping baby-wise with dreams, not teardrops, brimming our clenched eyes, pure dreams that know not taint nor earthly stain. We must get home, we must get home again. We must get home. There only may we find the little playmates that we left behind, some racing down the road, some by the brook, some droning at their desks with wistful look across the fields and orchards farther still where laughs and weeps the old wheel at the mill. We must get home. The willow whistles call, trills crisp and liquid as the waterfall, mocking the trillers in the cherry trees and making discord of such rhymes as these that know not lilt nor cadence, but the birds first warbled than all poets afterwards. We must get home and unremembering there all gain of all ambition otherwhere, rest from the feverish victory and the crown of conquest whose waste glory weighs us down. Fame's fairest gifts we toss back with disdain. We must get home. We must get home again. We must get home again. We must. We must. Our rainy faces pelted in the dust creep back from the vain quest through endless strife to find not anywhere in all of life a happier happiness than blessed us then. We must get home. We must get home again. A thing it's about as trying as a healthy man can meet is some poor fellow's funeral a jogging along the street. The slow hearse and the horses, slow enough to say the least, for to even tax the patience of the gentleman deceased. The low scrunch of the gravel and the slow grind of the wheels, the low, slow go of every woe that everybody feels. So I rather like the contrast when I hear the whiplash crack, a quick step for the horses when the hearse comes back. Meet it going towards the cemetery, you'll want to drop your eyes but if the plumes don't fetch you, it'll fetch you otherwise. You'll have to see the casket, though you'd ought to look away and economize and save your sight for just another day. 
Your sympathizing won't wake up the sleeper from his rest. Your tears won't thaw them hands of his that froze across his breast. And this is why, when earth and skies are getting blurred and black, I like the flash and hurry when the hearse comes back. It's not because I don't appreciate it ain't no time for jokes, nor cause I got no common human feeling for the folks. I went to funerals myself and took on some, perhaps, for my heart's about as malleable as any other chap's. I buried father, mother, but I'll, I'll have to just get you to excuse me, as the fellow says. The point I'm driving to is simply, when we're plumb broke down and all knocked out of whack, it helps to shape us up like when the hearse comes back. The idea wading around here over shoe mouth deep in woe, when there's a graded pike of joy of sunshine, don't you know, when evening strikes the pasture cows will pull out for the bars and skittish like from out the night will prance the happy stars. And, and so when my town comes to die and I've got every friend that once expressed my last request, I'll maybe recommend to drive slow if they have to going along the outer track. But I'll smile and say, you speed them when the hearse comes back. I've been down to the Capitol at Washington, D.C., where Congress meets and passes on the pensions ought to be allowed to old one-legged chaps like me that since the war don't wear their pants and pairs at all, and, and yet how proud we are. Old Flukins from our district just turned in and Tuck made me stay with him while I was there, and longer it I stayed, the more I kept a wanting just to kind of get away. And yet a feeling sociabler with flukins every day. You see, I, I got the idea, and I guess most folks agree, that men as rich as him, you know, can do just what they please. A man worth stacks of money and a congressman and all, and living in a building bigger than a Masonic hall. Now mine, I'm, I'm not a fault in fluke. He made his money square. We both was 49ers and both busted getting there. And I weakened and unwindless and he stuck and stayed and made his millions. Don't know what I'm worth until my pension's paid. But I was gonna tell you, or rather gonna try to tell you how he's living now. Gas burning mighty nine every room about the house and. Every night about some blame reception going on and money going out. There's people there from all the world, just every kind, engines and all, and senators and representatives and, and girls, you know. Yeah, dressed in gauze and roses. I declare, even old men shambling around waltzing with them there. And hands are tooting circumstances and, and away in some other room just choking full of hothouse plants and pineys and perfume and fountains, squirting steady all the time and statues made out of pure marble, appeared like sneaking around there in the shade. And Fluke, he coaxed and begged and pled with me to take a hand and sashay in amongst them, crutch and all, you understand. But when I said how tired I was and made for open air, he, he followed. Until five o'clock we sat a-talking there. My God, says he, Fluke says to me, I'm tired than you. Don't put up your tobacco till you give a man a chew. Set back a little further in the shatter and that'll do. I'm tired than you, old man. I'm tired than you. You see that air old dome, he said, humped up against the sky? It's grand first time you see it, but it changes by and by. And, and then it says just that away, just anchored high and dry betwixt the sky up yonder and aching of your eye. Night's pretty, not so pretty though as what it used to be. When my first wife was living, you remember her? Says he, I nodded like and Fluke went on, I wonder now if she knows where I am and, and what I am and, and what I used to be. That band in there, I used to think that music couldn't couldn't wear a feller out the way it does, but, but that ain't music there, that's just the imitation. Like everything I swear I hear, 
or see or touch or taste or tackle anywhere. It's all just artificial. Let's see our high-priced life of ours. The theory, it's sweet enough till it saps down and sours. There's no home left. No ties a home about it. By the powers of whole things artificial and artificial flowers. And all I want and could lay down and sob for is to know the homely things of homely life. For instance, just to go and sit down by the kitchen stove. Lord, that had rest me so. Just sat there like I used to do and laugh and joke, you know. Just sat there like I used to do, says Fluke, starting in, appeared like to say the whole thing over again to himself. Then stopped and turned and kind of coughed and stooped and fondled for something under the grass and maybe his handkerchief. Well, since I'm back from Washington, where I left Fluke still a legging for me, heart and soul on that air pension bill, I've halfway struck the notion when I think of wealth and such. There's nothing much patheticer than just a being rich. You better not fool with a bumblebee. If you don't think they can sting, ha, huh, you'll see. They're lazy to look at and kind of go buzzing and bumming around so slow and act so slouchy and all fagged out and dangling their legs as they drone about the hollyhocks that they can't climb in without just, just tumbling out again. Once I watched one climb clean way in, in a jimson blossom I did one day, and, and I just grabbed it and then let go. Oh, oh, honey, I, I told you so, says a raggedy man. He just run and pulled out the stinger and don't laugh none, says, there has been folks, I guess, that thought I was prejudiced, more or less, yet I still maintain that a bumblebee wears out his welcome too quick for me. One time, when we was at Auntie's house, way in the country, where they is but woods and pigs and cows and all's outdoors and air, an orchard swing, and cherry trees, and, and cherries in them. Yeah, and, and these here redhead birds steals all they please and, and, and tetch them if you dare. Why, once, one time when we was there, we ate out on the porch. Right where the cellar door was shut, the table was, and, and I let Auntie set by me and, and cut my vittles up, and pie, it was awful funny. I, I could see the redheads in the cherry tree and beehives where you got to be so careful going by and company there and all, and, and we, we had out on the porch. And I used to preserves and things that Ma don't allow me to, and, and chicken gizzards don't wings don't like wings, like parents does, do you? And all the times the wind blowed there and I could feel it in my hair and smell clover everywhere and an old redhead flew pert and I right over my high chair when we et out on the porch. My mother, she's so good to me, if I was good as I could be, I couldn't be as good. No, sir, can't any boy be good as her. She loves me when I'm glad or sad. She loves me when I'm good or bad. And what's the funniest thing she says she loves me? When she punishes. I don't like her to punish me. I, it don't hurt, but it hurts to see her crying. And then I cry, and then we both cry and be good again. She loves me when she cuts and sews my little cloak on Sunday's clothes. And when my pa comes home to tea, she loves him most as much as me. She laughs and tells him all I said and grabs me up and pats my head and I hug her and hug my pa and love him pert and I as much as ma. How slight a thing may set one's fancy drifting upon the dead sea of the past, a view, sometimes an odor, or a rooster lifting a far off, ooh, 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 ooh. 
And suddenly we find ourselves astray in some woods pasture on the long ago, or idly dream again upon a day of rest we used to know. I bit an apple but a moment since, a wilted apple that the worm had spurned, yet hidden in the taste were happy hints of good old days returned. And so my heart, like some enraptured lute, tinkles a tune so tender and complete, God's blessing must be resting on the fruit, so bitter, yet so sweet. Tell you a story, it's a fact. Once was a little boy, name was Jack, and he had sword and buckle and strap made of gold and a, a visible cap, and he killed giants that had whole cows, the horns and all, and pigs and sows. But Jack, his golding sword was oh so awful sharp and he could go and cut the old giants clean too for he knowed what he was going to do. And one old giant, he had four heads. The name was Bumblebore. And he was feared of Jack because he, Jack, he killed six, five, ten, three, and all other giants but him. And there was a place Jack had to swim before he could get to old Bumblebore. And then there was Griffins at the door. But Jack, he just plunged in, swum clean across, and when he come to the other side, he, he put on his visible cap and, and then, doggone, you, could, you couldn't see him at all. And so he slewed the griffins, boff, you know. And then was a horn hung over his head high on the wall and words that read, whoever can this trumpet blow shall cause the giant's overthrow. And Jack, he that reached up and blowed the stuffing out of it and throwed the castle gates wide open and, and then tuck his gold sword in his hand and this marched up to old Bumblebore and before he knowed he put about four heads on him and, and chopped them off too. Whew. Wished I'd been Jack, don't you? I have sipped with drooping lashes dreamy drafts of Verzenay I have flourished brandy smashes in the wildest sort of way. I have joked with Tom and Jerry till wee hours ayant the twall, but I found my tea the very safest tipple of them all. Tis a mystical potation that exceeds in warmth of glow and divine exhilaration all the drugs of long ago. All of old magicians' potions of Medea's filtered spells are of fabled isles and oceans where the lotus eater dwells. Though I've reveled o'er late lunches with blasé dramatic stars and absorbed their wit and punches and the fumes of their cigars, drank in the latest story with a cocktail either end, I have drained a deeper glory in a cup of tea, my friend. Green, black, moyune, formosa, conju, amboy, pingsway. No odds the name it knows. Ah, fill a cup of it for me. And as I clink my china against your goblet's brim, my tea in steam shall twine a fragrant laurel round its rim. <laughs>